So I think it's just about truth and integrity, authenticity, and being genuine around how you serve people. And if you get to that, and then accelerate that through to people in a really exciting and useful and, 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 and well-created way, then you've got an amazing brand. So I've been working in the creative industries now, coming on for about 20 years. But I actually came from an artistic background and straight out, out of college, I then moved into design and from there, graphic design. And I kind of navigated through a few different areas of design and landed in graphic design. I think that's where I felt most comfortable. And over many years, I built up my portfolio in graphic design and moved up to more of a senior designer level and eventually creative director. And now I've shifted over to being a brand strategist. So looking at branding and brand building. But at the heart of everything I do, I still love the artistic side of branding. I still love the visual side of things. And when I see great art and when I see great design, it inspires me. It makes me want to make more things and the creative industries is a funny place because there's so many different types of agencies. You've got design agencies or branding agencies or marketing agencies. And we're living in a, a time where there's so much throwaway content, it's just throwaway content culture. And because of that, sometimes designers and artists can lose almost the importance of great crafted design. Now, a few years ago, I was introduced to a, a global brand and communications agency called Dixon Baxi. And I would personally say they're one of the leaders in branding. And one of the reasons for this is because that the fabric of everything they do is the true love of art and the visual side of things and the experimentation and crafting beautiful, beautiful design. And today I had the opportunity to interview one of the founding directors, Simon Dixon. We spoke about lots of different things. We talked about brand foundations. We talked about the amazing work that they're doing with their clients. We talked about what the, the importance of a brand and what makes the, the brand purpose and the vision and the culture and how that all works together to form great brands. So I hope you enjoy the interview. And this is Simon Dixon from Dixon Baxi. Simon, thank you so much for joining me today. I was about to ask you, how's life returning back to the studio? But we've kind of just gone on that. Tell me a bit about where you are now and, and how the remote working is happening since or over the last 12 months. Yeah, cool. well, um, yeah, thanks for having me. It's, uh, it's really nice to chat. Yeah, it's, um, it seems a long time now. It's nearly 18 months now that we've been working remotely. And historically, as a company, as a design agency, we've always worked remotely with a lot of clients because 80% of our work is international. So we work in Los Angeles, Russia, Japan. So we're used to the technology, the kind of video conferencing and the process of creativity at distance. But having the studio in different houses and different locations is quite weird. So... I'm in Oxfordshire as we talk, so I'm outside of London. Most of the team are in London, uh, some are in other countries at the moment, they've gone back home. And yeah, it's, it's generally gone very well. I think we've tried to hang on to the habits and rituals and the principles and ethos that drives the company. So rather than worry about technology and systems, we try to worry about what we're creating together, why we're creating and how we kind of help each other get through that process. Yeah, brilliant. Because I know that the studio is is really important to you because it's yeah. more than just a place where we have our computers and we work. I know for you and a, and a lot of design studios, but very much at Dixon Baxi, it was a play, it was a hub, it was a place of ideas, it was a place where you'd kick around, you know, creativity and spitball and and stuff like that. How how has that changed, and and how do you see? that hub of creativity changing with the, the new ways of working that we're all seeing now? Yeah, it's, it's a very good question. And in a sense, what we're trying to do is test assumptions, things we've learned. 
So you've always had this idea that we're kind of in beta, that the company's never quite fixed in, in its state. And what we found is humans are basically tribal and creativity is about collaboration. And that takes um, that kind of magic that you get from a bunch of people who are working together and the serendipity of how ideas are created. And a physical space is really helpful to that. So the way we're looking at it is having a more fluid way of working. So the studio we're going to see more as a campus, which is something we'll come together around. And certainly in the early phases of coming back to studio, we'll come together more. So we're thinking that we'll work Tuesdays, Wednesdays and Thursdays together as a team. And then Mondays and Fridays will be flexible. You can do what you want on those days, come in or, or stay at home. But we'll test how we get that magic back, the kind of glue of working together and the space between people. And it's that energy. And I think if you're doing any collective endeavor, there's 40 of us as a team, plus our clients and our collaborators and all those people, it can be many hundreds of people over a, a period of time. That contact, I think, is vital to create interesting ideas. You can work remotely, but there's a tension to that and a distancing quality that doesn't give you the same humanity that it does when you're with a person. So we're going to try and strike a balance between the two things. What's great about lockdown, and I, I mean that obviously in the best possible sense of there's a lot of horrible things, but the best thing it's done is it's broken the, the, the kind of habits that a lot of us had and the worries really, the, the worry that something might go wrong if you let everybody work differently. And of course, what that's done is said, it's okay. You know, if we can all work remotely completely in different parts of the world for 18 months, we can certainly work differently when we have a studio. So we're trying to balance the best of both worlds and we'll just test that over the next six to nine months. Yeah, brilliant. Now, I love the fact that you're you're looking at this blended approach and looking at the things that that you loved before and the things that worked before and then kind of ripping up the rule book of the things that were that, that didn't work so well. I, I, um, I had a good chat with a friend of mine. This was right at the beginning in lockdown one. And he says one of the best things, and I don't want to say you know, best things out of COVID because it's a terrible situation, but there are some positive things that have come out of it from a work point of view, is that he said it got rid of the gubbins. And what he meant by that, you know, like the, the pointless meetings or the, the traveling that you go somewhere when you actually think, no, that could have been done over Zoom, et cetera. And I think in some ways it has allowed us to be more productive. It's allowed us to to you know be more streamlined be more proactive in certain areas and obviously then the other things that did did work we're accentuating that and revisiting that so I love the fact that you're looking at this splendid approach yeah it's interesting to say that because I don't actually 100% agree with that because what I found is people are overproductive and there's too many meetings because we can go from meeting to meeting using technology it means you do more and there's less downtime. And I think the thing I find is if I fly to Milan to meet a client, that journey is part of the life experience that helps dictate how I react to the project. If I'm walking through London and I hear some music, see someone's jacket and I get a coffee, that puts me in a different mindset. If I go from one meeting to another meeting through Zoom or Teams, there is, there is no respite, there, there's, there's nothing there. And I think one of the dangers of overcorrection when we think about working remotely and the power of technology is that we're over gearing ourselves mentally. And I actually think it's the, the downtime, the quiet moments, the things that you take for granted, the travel and the, 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 the commute, they're actually part of the, the, the glue of life. And that's what makes you who you are because that's experience in life and I think, if you're a creative person, you have to be experiencing life. You can't just create, and you certainly can't let technology dictate that. So we, I agree with you in some senses, but we've been very cautious about burnout because of um, the incessant quality of starting work and just bang, 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 bang. And I think that's happened to a lot of people. The, the focus has, has been on the productivity you can get from technology, but I kind of think that isn't how creativity works. Yeah, I, I really love you saying about the journey somewhere, you know, going somewhere and, and taking that time to, to kind of be thinking about where you're going and soak it in and see things. And I often I find that when I 
going to say to meet a client for the first time or I'm delivering an idea etc there's always things that happen on the way to that that are always related to the thing that you're about to do like the bit in the book that you read is always really related to about the to the conversation that you have and you kind of relay that something you've just seen or done just before you kind of scrap up what you were going to talk about and then and then say something different and I, and I agree those little mini experiences mm-hmm contribute so much to the overall experience and the thing that you're looking to do so no I I totally get where you're coming from on that it's kind of um it's a change of energy state sitting in a chair and talking isn't a very good way of 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 creating and 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 having a dialogue and you need to I think go through some sort of flux and it's good to have things that are difficult as well as easy because there's a sense that the, the more ease the more productive we are, the simpler things are, the less noise there are, the better it is. But I, I, I'm not sure that really works because the ups and downs of life are what gives you creative energy. And, and that's what I look for when I'm working is I need something that fuels me. And, and like you say, listening to that podcast, seeing that person's sneakers, um, smelling that coffee that I was talking about, it, it makes you think differently. And that's what creativity is about. It's about diverse perspectives and experiences and how what you learn both in the real world and in the brief and with your clients and your team is translated into your work and if you don't go anywhere and if you just use technology I don't know you get the most of what being a creative person is yeah and 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 that's without getting into galleries and music and going to pubs and festivals and stuff do you know what's lovely hearing you talk and and the thing and hearing you talk on the videos that I've caught up with another podcast is you really talk like an artist and not a designer. So much <laughs> of the things that you say in terms of the rebellious, the bravery, the experimentation and all these things, you you definitely sound more of an artist than a designer. And I, that's really refreshing. It's really it's amazing. It's interesting. No, no one specifically ever said that before. But it, it, it ties a little bit into something that Apova and I, um, my business partner and the Baxi of Dixon Baxi, talk about a lot, which is we believe we're commercial artists. At a fundamental level, that's what we are. We obviously, we're in communications and design. But we're commercial artists, so there is a kind of a personal process that you go through to create things you love, that validate you, make you feel good about yourself and allow you to express yourself. But what's interesting is you're doing it on behalf of other people. In our case, it's tens, if not hundreds of millions of people. And there's a wonderful tension between those two things. And what we found historically is if you design for millions and millions of people, often that gets rounded and simplified, dumbed down. We actually rail against that because we think people intuitively want interesting and delightful and and meaningful experiences. So we try to surprise them and excite them and at scale do things which um, move the dial I think and that's what design is it's something that's useful but I think at its best it's something that's beautiful and enriches the world as well as being functional. Mm. And I'm guessing within within when you're approaching a new brief and a project you you have design systems and a framework that you tend to go back to because they work but it it kind of I get the feeling that you approach each new brief in a new way with new new lens with a new audience and and look at it more not in a new media as well but you look at things trying to find the right communications the right tools and the right information and messages to that new audience and that process I take it must bring new creativity new influences new styles w- would you agree on that yeah I think I think it's a it's a very valid point like all agencies we have a process but all processes are basically the same which is you begin the project and understand the challenge you then gather insights you immerse yourself you you gain knowledge about the challenge itself you then translate that in our case it's into strategy because we're a branding agency and then those strategies which should have purpose and, and and kind of meaning and something that drives value for people into design which becomes a system and in our case we're designing very large ecosystems that are interconnected across every de- device platform and then you implement it you make it and everyone pretty much does the same thing some people come in a bit later some people leave a bit earlier but that's the process But within our actual 
process itself is a set of methods. And what they are is kind of self-learning and rapid learning tools. They're, they're things that create a safe space to have honest conversations about creativity. It's about becoming a fan of what you're working on. So you fall in love with the thing you're doing. Um, but really it's about listening to people and being fluent in people and listening for the things that will inform what they care about, the people you design for, what they care about and what you're creating will do for them. Because obviously we design for the client and the brand, but really we design for the people we design for. And it's that relationship we're looking for. And, you know, we go out and meet them. We have lots of processes for that. And on top of that, I think you've got to challenge yourself to do something different because it's so easy to do a great job. And then someone says to you, hey, we like that. Could you do that again? But of course, as soon as you do that, you're doing the same thing and, and you can kind of atrophy a little bit. So we get a bit anxious if we start to repeat too much. Of course, as probably every design studio has a bit of a style, but we try not to... We try to be stylish rather than have a style. Mm. You know, it's great when you talk about that you you try and fall in love with what you're doing. And I, and I found that I've, I would say I'm more of a brand strategist now, but I come from a creative direction point of view from the studio. And one of the things that I had to learn in that time was to try and fall in love with that project, with that client. And not all of them are glamorous. Not all of them are these incredible big, you know, companies that have you know amazing artwork and amazing amazing creativity sometimes they're a little bit of, on the dull side but do you know what I actually find that's when I'm at my best because trying to find a way that I can f- connect with them connect with their audience find out what's appealing or what's special or what's different about that product or campaign and then then add my creative creativity to it and um, Natalie the studio director we're training her up at the moment to be creative director and I'm trying to trying to get her to fall in love with things that she wouldn't normally fall in love with she's amazing on projects that she enjoys but the other clients mm, she's not as as um, you know as she didn't see it as when it's not fun she doesn't get stuck in but now it's interesting you talk about falling in love with your your clients projects I mean it's interesting you're talking about being a professional creative there aren't you which is um there is no perfect state for creativity it's a messy business and of course you're doing it on behalf of and with people to create the work it's it's not pure art it is it's commercial art, as I was saying earlier and we've always believed um there's an opportunity in a brief. Every brief is an opportunity to do something interesting. And if you design with optimism and you design uh, with a kind of sense of purpose and something that you think will change the, the game in some way, you can do something interesting because of course, not every project is a kind of triple A amazing thing. Sometimes you get a tiny little brief and I'm often asked, you know, how do we get to do what we do? But of course, I've been doing this for 30 years and I started out doing tiny, you know, hairdressers logos and, and, and things for little kind of record labels and clawed my way up to where I am now slowly over time. But each project I did, I, I, I gave the same level of respect to that I cared that I did a good job on every on every project. And of course, some are better than others down to my skill as well. But the duty of care was pretty much the same on every single one. And what we do now is curate our clients in the most positive sense, which is if we don't think we're a good fit, we tend not to work on those projects. So we Mm. tend to look for people where the mindset and the kind of collaborative energy is very similar. Um, Because, you know, on a scale of one to 10, one being evolution and 10 being revolution, we're in the five to 10 space. So we're we're big, bigger change makers, I think. So if somebody wants something that isn't less than that, it may be better they work with someone else. So we tend to try and balance the type of work we do to fit our mindset. And I don't mean that in an arrogant way. I just mean in we're just good at some work versus others. That's all. Yeah. Is there an element there, though, that some of these brands or products or campaigns, whatever, that it, it doesn't excite you as well? Is, it, is there something where you think, well, we get along and we like them, but we just don't, we just don't, we're not feeling what they do. Is there an element of that or is it just the connectivity of who you are and, and how it works? Personally, no, I I never have that feeling. I'm just hardwired to work with people and create things that I care about. Of course, sometimes you you start a relationship with with somebody and you realize that their worldview is different to yours. And what you have to do is do a good, good job in those circumstances and then not repeat that 
that again. And that's how we look at it. So over the years, we figured out a kind of metric for what success looks like for us and how relationships work. Um, but I think if you're in it, you should be in it and committed and, and you should do the very best to do something amazing. I don't like, there's, um, there's a slight tension in the industry of like clients get in the way, clients give you feedback, clients, there's a slightly combative thing to it. And I just think that's a little bit crazy because all clients are facilitators of, of the work and every DNAD and Clio an amazing project that has ever been made has been facilitated or sponsored by a client. So we have huge respect for them because they're the ones who allow you to make awesome work. So you just have to write, find the right client, I think. Mm. The, the metric or guideline or matrix, um, whatever you want to call it, that you kind of look at a new client to work with. Um, what are some of the factors that you're looking for? What are the things that you're, that you know, that you want to look for within that team or that person that thinks about well, these are the people that we want to work with first thing is um it goes back to what i was saying is listening to them um what we do what we don't do is sell what we do so we, we'll talk to somebody and we'll listen to them and say well this seems to be the problem you have and we try and empathize or, or, or get into the mindset of where they are in the journey of their brand and their own particular uh, uh career moment where they tend to be doing something large. We do brand change programs. So we don't do campaigns. We, we do kind of rebranding or brand change programs. And they're a huge responsibility. So the people we're dealing with are in a transitional period where they're about to change the company that they're part of quite substantially. So our job is to listen to that and figure out how we can facilitate that. And then we talk about our methodologies. We talk about how we work. And what we're looking for is a common ambition or common ground, a way of seeing the project. And do we believe that shared ambition and idea as a brief works? And, and that's what we do. And I think it's all about chemistry. It's all about chemistry. And if you find the right people, you know, you're not going to become best friends with all of them for the rest of your life. But in that moment, you can achieve quite a lot together. So there's that kind of metric. And then our, do our skill sets match the project? Is the ambition, like, as I say, of the right level? Um, can they afford it? You know, all those types of things. And, and you say that some some agencies would, or suppliers or contractors will drop in early or, or drop off late. In the whole process of being a, a brand and communications agency, are you there, do you have clients that you stay with that you manage their accounts, their websites, their ads and all that kind of thing or is it mainly just you know that first beginning third or how you know how long do you stay with a client some clients we stay a long time with and what it tends to be is we'll go through a um a change program so for example one of our clients is british land and we've helped them with the sequence of large branding projects for different placemaking um brands around london but also the overarching strategy that drives that so instead of it just being do some hoardings, a bit of place making and some design. There's a strategy about how British land wants to be a more sustainable, more community driven and a more kind of um, useful place making company for the people that are in their buildings and in the communities that they're developing. So we've helped them with those strategies and then we help them with the design and branding implications of that for specific projects. So that's a many year relationship um, with somebody like AC Milan that was about taking them, taking 120 years of history and retooling them for the future. So we maintain a relationship with them, but we'll, we'll have less work to do in terms of maintaining the website and things like that because their internal teams do that. And a lot of our clients own their own products, their own services, their own social, their own uh, kind of content feeds. So what we do is create the systems that allows them to then take it on. And we come back for the larger change program work. Yeah, I mean, is it, almost, is it sometimes like passing on a, a small child when you yeah. hand it over? <laughs> yeah, yeah, the screaming child. It's, it's, it's an interesting um, part of the job is we talk about this where you fall in love with the work. So with AC Milan, you know, I'm a football fan. Uh, I love AC Milan as a club anyway. Um, and it was an amazing project. And when we hand over the kind of keys to the brand, the car, and give them to them and all the tools and habits and systems, to use there is a moment like a pang where you're like wow that's it now we're handing it over um but i'll always be a ross and area kind of uh, you know milanese fan so 
you you just have it as a really warm memory and then we'll come back at some point hopefully to work with them again on a specific project and you just refuel that fire and continue on and we do a lot of work where we look at who's going to take the brand from us so we don't create guidelines and give somebody a pdf we tend to give them tools and habits design systems and often we'll give them videos and we'll the idea is to teach a person to fish we teach them the rules and regulation, not regulations, the rules and habits of the brand mm. and the principles, the design principles that deliver that, that come from the strategy so that everyone, everyone has a reason to believe in the brand. And then that should accelerate them. They should take that brand and create things we never could. And that's what's so exciting. When I look back and look at the media center for AC Milan, I'm like, wow, that looks amazing. We didn't design the media center, but the playbook and the, the tools and principles we gave fueled it. And so I still get a vicarious thrill from it. I bet. And it must be amazing when you see these brands take it to another level and improve on it. I'm sure it must go the other way as well. But, you know, you see them adapt it and change it and evolve it. And that must be amazing to watch. Yeah. And it's a, it's a test of the system, really, which is if you if you get the strategy right and it really is meaningful and, and, and purposeful for the business and makes a difference. And then you translate that into a design system that really works. It should it should work indefinitely. And there's a reason great brands are successful, someone like Nike, is their strategy is so distinct and clear and the translation of that is so distinct and clear. You can change trends and situations and sports and all those various things that happen over decades, but the truth of what they do for people is the same. And I think that's what you look for, is something that has, um, it's rarefied to the point that it's meaningful long-term. And we tend to look for that. We look for things that will change things over a long period rather than a quick fix. Hey everyone, I just wanted to jump in here and offer my support. If you're looking to solve your business challenges, you're looking for new ideas, or you're simply just looking to grow your organization, then it's time for a new brand strategy. I'd love to know more about you and your business. So get in touch with me through seedcreativity.co.uk and we can get things moving. Now back to the show. Amazing. Okay, cool. We, I'm going to jump into some, I call them quick fire questions, oh, no. but they're often not quick fire and they normally give the longest answers, but they normally give the best answers. Okay. So I've got quite a few. Just to let you know, when I, when I normally have a chat with people on the show, I normally have one page of sort of notes and questions. You've got five. There's so much <laughs> stuff I want to ask you, but we're doing really well and you're answering a lot of it anyway. So that's amazing. So the first quick fire, this is a question that I've been asking everyone on the live videos and, and uh, on, the, on the podcast. But what's the most important thing that you've learned in the past 18 months? Um, that is a very good question. It's, yeah, the tr honest thing is people matter. The work, the systems, the technology, all of that's meaningless if you don't look after people. And one of the things I carry heaviest is my responsibility for the team that we employ and the ethos we've created and the energy we, 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 we've created. So, yeah, that's the thing I think about by far the most. So, for example, when, when um, lockdown happened, first of all, there was a lot of furloughing of people and we lost lots of projects and we're like, man, what's going to happen? You don't know about the future. But we made a kind of commitment that we wouldn't furlough anyone. We'd rather invest in the team and protect them and not marginalize them in any way and, and try and shield them from what the part we can shield people from. So I think they're the things I think about most is if we do a good job. And of course, over I've had agencies for 30 years and Dixon Bax is nearly 20 years old now. I'm sure we've made hundreds of terrible mistakes in lots of different ways. And you, you carry that burden, uh, I suppose, to a certain degree. But if you focus on people and do the right thing, thing for them and create a space that they can collaborate together and they can look after each other and there's a duty of care between them, that teamwork part of it, I think, is the thing that's most important. And, and it was really magnified by lockdown. Yeah, I think it was about a third or fourth week into lockdown. You guys released that video and it was kind of like a little snapshot of 
of what was happening in your lives. And there was a few lovely little cutaways. I think someone was on a flat and they took take some lovely, lovely shots. And then it kind of like warmed up into your projects and what was happening and some shots of like conversations over Zoom. And it was, it was a really beautiful insight to how you were dealing with things at that time. But there was such a level of optimism in there and there was such a great positivity between you and your team. And that I think there was a line in there that you were saying, oh, you know, we, we can still great deliver great work in this condition. And and it was almost a, you know, a pat your tap on, um, pat on your own back. There, it was such a lovely little piece of, of, um, of footage there that you created. It's nice, uh, it's nice you felt that. I think um, it, it's an interesting topic, isn't it? Optimism, because when it's difficult, you do have to be a realist. And of course, if you run an agency, you definitely have to be a realist. But I've always believed it's it's far easier to tackle problems if you're optimistic and positive. And I think we did try to project optimism and positivity when lockdown was happening because I didn't think the world was going to end and I knew we would come out of it I didn't know when but we've been through all sorts of difficult things as an agency we were part of an agency that was around in New York when 9-11 happened things like that which they're profound things in your life but of course the the, the way you deal with that and the way you look at things and what we do is focus on the things we can control rather than everything I think it just allows you to get through that and at least focus on the things that matter. And for us, it's creativity, it's making the work we work, uh, we want to work on. So we just focus on that. And, and I think it gives you a degree of strength. It doesn't uh, protect you from everything, but it gives you uh, a sense that at least you're doing something. Yeah, no, I, I agree on that one. I, I feel like I do my best work when I'm in a good place, when I'm feeling happy. I think when I'm, ha in a, in a, when I'm happy, I'm more creative. But I also agree that I feel like I've got more drive and ambition when, I, when the chips are down, when I feel like I'm a bit of an un underdog in the situation. So you mix the two together. I feel like that's when I'm at my best. And I saw a glimpse of that in that video. You know, you were you were up against it. There was a lot happening, but you were sticking together and you felt positive. And I can imagine some great work came out of that time. Yeah, can't wait to show. We've got about nine projects we haven't shown. So hopefully in the next six months, you'll get to see a bunch of it. Wicked. Brilliant. Okay, the next one. This is Well, it's one question, but I split it to you. But what's your biggest weakness? Yeah, it's cross between being arrogant or uh, too ambitious. I don't see either of them being a negative, to be honest. <laughs> <I don't know. laughs> well, the, the second part of the question is, is something you would change about yourself? Would you change, change that? No, I wouldn't change anything. I don't, I, I'm not a person who regrets things. I'm a person who looks forward rather than backwards. And I think you're an aggregation of all your life experiences. It goes back to what we are talking about earlier about experiencing life. And I think you know, humans are not perfect. And I am definitely not perfect. I'm an aggregation of everything that's made me, but I'm happy where I am. I'm happy what I'm doing. I'm happy in my life. I'm happy in, in work. So why would I change anything? Yeah, no, I agree with that. I think for me, I'd say my, one of my biggest weaknesses is, is I'm not very patient anymore. And it's getting no, worse okay. as I get older, yeah. uh, especially when I'm waiting for things. And I think that becomes because of the, my, some of my strength is that I'm eager to move forward and I'm, and I want things to happen fast and I'm quite driven and ambitious. So, um, you know, I'm not very patient, which is, uh, so maybe that's, me. it's funny, isn't it? Everybody has strengths and weaknesses. And, and, you know, when, when we think about employing people, we think about people's strengths. And when you think about working together, you think about their strengths because for all the kind of negativity that might come from impatience, it's amazing fuel, isn't it? And it's infectious. And, and it's effective and it's, it's driven. So that is a, it's like a superpower, isn't it? So you've just got to balance the two things, I think, and make sure that the negative part of impatience doesn't impinge too much, but the positive part of it actually makes a massive difference and probably the reason you're so successful. Okay, thank you. Okay, your best teacher. Oh, wow. Um, I've been lucky enough to work with a lot of uh, great people, but of course my current um, business partner, Apova, I've worked with him for 26 years. So I think that relationship is, uh, apart from my wife, is the most defining relationship in, in my life um, because the two of us are, are much stronger than the, the individuals. But to be honest with you, I'm self-taught. I started my first in agency when I was 19, when I was at college. 
I did it with two two friends. Um, I went to college when I was 15 and I kind of got in the game by doing and that I, I've always tried, done, failed, try again and built. That's what I do. So I, again, this is borderline arrogant. I appreciate by saying this, but um, I think I've learned by doing rather than being taught by anybody. What, what does, um, in terms of the dynamic in your relationship with your business partner, Porva, how, how does it work? They like to work together for 26 years. I, you know, I tip my hat to you. Um, you know, it sounds like there's a, uh, I don't want to say yin and yang, but you must bring strengths and weaknesses together and you support each other. You must be very, very good friends to have worked together for this amount of time. Yeah. Well, he's, he's more like my brother. He's more like my brother than a friend. And you know, we met in our early twenties, so that you know, that's half my li- more than half my life I've known him. So it's you know, he's a defining relationship, and I think it's about like when I'm down, he picks me up. When when you know, when we're not sure, we can question each other. But we have a kind of very simple tip tap relationship, which is every day. It's like I was thinking this. What do you think? I think this. I think that. And there's something great about just constantly building and just having a chat and doing something and trying something. And we both st- still have the same enthusiasm for what we do, the same ambition to get better at what we do. And we love having an entity to be able to do that. So there's enough commonality in our kind of drive and excitement and enthusiasm for what we do as creative people, but there's enough difference that we don't overlap too much. And that's, you know, I think it helps the company as well because there's, I tend to be maybe a bit more rambunctious and a little bit kind of more forward in some instances. But Paul Vop, um, Paul operates as the ECD, so he's our kind of creative focus. And, you know, and sometimes that swaps over. And there's something quite nice about that. I think there's a nice synergy, but there's enough difference. Yeah. There's a piece of work I do with the strategy that I do with my clients all around about values. And I kind of move that onto foundational values, which then is all about action and turning them into guiding principles. And then we look at philosophy. And the philosophy, for, if it's just, one person or for its 10,000 people as you move into more people it's very much about common beliefs or shared beliefs or common grounds and it sounds like the strength that Dixon Baxi has with this, its two original founders is that you have a lot of shared beliefs with the poor bar, a lot of the same foundational values and I think that has given your the strength in your relationship but then that puts the strength in the foundations of your brand and I was going to lead on to this a bit later but I might jump into this now actually is that because you've put so much time into the foundations of your brand and you talk about it being distinct and clear about what they are um that has would you say that's allowed you to grow the company that you're looking for and that with that knowledge that then echoes into your to your clients yeah it's it's like a self-fulfilling prophecy so every decision you make determines whether or not you reach the thing you'd like to achieve and the, the clearer you are about what you'd like to do the easier the decision making tree is because you can go, if we do this, will we be the type of agency we want to be? And saying no is a very powerful tool. Not doing things is defines you just as much as doing things. So we're very um, explicit. We're also very simple about things. We like things to be simple. We like things to be actionable. So we're very kind of, what's the thing? What are we gonna do? Let's do it. And that has served as, as, as very well. We're also, um, we like this idea of rejecting convention so that we don't have to do it on the terms of what other people believe the industry should be like, because there's millions of great agencies and there's loads of ways of being creative. So you have to find something that suits your mindset. And I think it's about creating a space where you control that destiny and be be self-determined. And I think if you're self-determined, you tend to be happier. And if you're self-determined, that tends to reflect out and it attracts people who like the same sort of thing or are interested in the same sort of mindsets. And, and, And that's how we work because we don't sell creativity. We express the way we see creativity and then we collaborate with the people who match that, that, that mindset and the effect of it. I love that. And, um, recently reading the Simon Sinek book start with why he mentions that if you focus on the why and focus like on those, whether we call it guiding principles or your or your uh, shared beliefs or the vision of where you're going he says it's like a, a light bulb to a moth 
And I, I've heard you mentioned it a few times that, you know, if you create the work that you want to create, if you be the person or the agency that you want to be, it will attract the right clients and it will attract the right work. Exactly. It, and the why book's a really interesting one, isn't it? Because it, it, it's, it's a very simple way of aggregating the power of what strategy does. And, and it's been a powerful tool in lots of different ways. And, and, and why is probably the, the most succinct way of looking at it. But my feeling is it only works if you translate that into habits and behaviors, because big ideas like why, okay, I've got that, but now how do I do it? And I think that's where a lot of those strategies fall down, which is the big ideas are really powerful, the moth to the flame, but I don't want to get burnt. <laughs> You know, I, I want a long, to, like, like a, a lifelong journey of creativity, and that's going to change. So, if you get the fundamental why and the principles and uh, of how you carry yourself right, you still got to translate that into something that's actionable. Whether you're a brand or a creative person, and I think there's a lot of conversation about purpose and why in the beginning, and there's a lot of conversation about execution. But the translation of one to the other, very few people talk about, and that's the space I'm actually most interested in at the moment because it seems to have the most effect if you can translate the power of what you want to do into something tangible. Yeah, I agree. The, the framework that the core, the framework that I work with my clients is, is you have the purpose, which is the why, mm -hmm. um, the vision, which is the where, and those can be broken down into key milestones throughout that, throughout the journey, whether it be five years or 10 years. And then the, the actual behavior side of things, I call that the philosophy, which is the way which is like the Milan, uh, Mandalorian, this is the way. Yeah. And I totally believe that within the philosophy is the guiding principles. And so the way that I would see a guiding principle, it is a value plus action. So it's all well and good having a, a set of values up on our wall, say that we're ambitious, we're, we're driven, we're creative. But unless you back that up with an action and behavior, then it doesn't mean anything. And philosophy plus the behavior equals culture and to invest in the culture so that these things do get worked and lived by they you know they happen and these relationships happen it takes years and years of great leadership um a, a, a bond these kind of common goals and common ground to work on so yeah that foundation is, is is super important and i feel like with you and apoorva that you've used your own organization your own agency to learn how to do it and then you can use that learning with your clients you take it in there and you it's almost like the, you you are the prototype to figure out how do we build a brand yeah, and maybe, I, I do yeah, similar no. things it's, it's interesting and you know the way you're talking i think is is it's really interesting because there's not a lot of, I think, explicit conversations about this. Is the kind of actionable quality of strategy. And I also think there is quite a, a gap between design strategy and what branding actually is. And certainly branding in a digitally native environment, there's, there's a lot of kind of disconnect being, be, between product and services and strategy. There's a lot of brand in the brand and marketing, but there's and communications, but not a lot in the product and service sometimes, or sometimes the product itself is mainly the brand. So there's a really inter interesting kind of uh, tension at the moment about where the industry is going. And that, that kind of fuel you're talking about, that kind of translation of ideas, which could be empty and meaningless into something you can use, can really radically improve companies and, and do it on behalf of um, people. Because again, that's the point, isn't it? It's, there's a lot of conversation about good brands and bad brands and doing the right thing. And I think being a good business for people should be hardwired at a core level and it shouldn't be a campaignable thing. It should be something that's right at the heart of them. Whatever you do for people shouldn't be a surface thing. It should be for real. Yeah. And that's what we try to do um, is, again, we don't always get it right, but we try and do the right things at the core of what we do. And we make business decisions to do that rather than just do marketing campaigns. Cause I think there's a, there's a tension there otherwise. Yeah. yeah I think this is the, the whole branding or brand building or brand strategy for me has become a lot more interesting with my clients whilst in parallel, I've been doing a lot of personal building and personal discovery and self-discovery and self-development because I'm trying to find out about myself and who I really am, who do I want to be and where do I want to go and how do I want to live my life? And then you can ask bigger questions. So like, 
what do I want my business to be? What do I want my organization to be? Where do I want to go? And I take these big, audacious, hairy questions into my clients and sit there f- with, with leadership team and say, what do you want? You know, these kind of big questions. What do you want? Who are you? Um, what's your higher purpose? What's your highest level of contribution? And then sit back and just see that because those are the best conversations because you're kind of stripping it all back and then having these real conversations about what the shared beliefs, what people want, who do they want to be? And, you know, and have those honest questions about what do people think about us? What do we think about us? And, and are we brave enough to change that? Because that ripple effect of those conversations then turns into these design systems that you talk about. We can turn them into design systems and we can find out who are we to our audience. And then we can create something that is going to be truly memorable and something they can connect with. And, and it's interesting that, you've, that you're really passionate about these areas now, because I think a lot of brand strategists, creative directors, agencies are all having very, very similar conversations. I mean, my, my feeling has always been you have to do it for real. It's got to be authentic because you can, you can, you can see companies who cheat and you can see companies who don't. And, and, and if you talk about what you are as a company, um, what makes you different, why you're useful and meaningful to people, and you root to that, then you can do something. If you you say, oh, we'd like, yeah, I don't know about you, but we, we get briefs sometimes where it opens up and it says, we'd like to be like Netflix and Apple and what Nike or whatever. And you're like, well, you can't be because you <laughs> that's not how your business works. You have to be your version of whatever good is and, and, and meaningful is. So I think it's just about truth and integrity, authenticity and being genuine around how you serve people. And if you get to that, and then accelerate that through to people in a really exciting and useful and, 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 and well-created way, then you've got an amazing brand because it, it's, it's real. It's completely seamless. Brilliant. I love it. I'm actually going to jump on to something I've been itching to talk to you about, and it's the evolution of an agency. And this is quite, I'm quite passionate about this. Um, and the reason I want to talk about this, so if we were to go back 30, 40, 50 years, we go back to the 60s and we look at, ad agencies and how they developed into design agencies or branding agencies and into marketing agencies. And I think along this journey, there is a, the lines have been blurred between communications, marketing and design. And we're kind of, because we live in this fast content culture, social, social media um, kind of time or culture, um, the, the love of art or the, the design thinking or the design centric area of an agency has some, somewhere been lost. But what I find is with Dixon Baxi is that you hold true to yourselves about the art about you know the importance of art the importance of words and pictures the importance of how beautiful crafted functional design has an effect on people and the way that they think how how, where does that passion come from and how consistent do you have to be with that I guess it's just hardwired I mean I trained as a designer and so did a pover so we're designers I guess by initial profession um but over the years, having run studios in London and New York and San Francisco, work globally, you realize the power of brand change, the, the ideas that drive design. And that's, that's the thing that we always look at is that there needs to be an idea that fuels the design. And then the implementation of that design needs to be truly well crafted and beautiful because this is a, a craft driven industry. And we're in communications, not, not the kind of marketing and selling part of things. So we're, we're building the content services, information services, the way that brands connect with the world and the way they, they kind of market to people, whereas advertising, of course, is, is, is slightly different to that. So we're in that kind of design category. And of course, in the design and branding category, you're only as good as how, the, how meaningful and real the idea is, how truthful it is how that's translated into something that actually delivers against that and how beautifully well-made that is. Because if you bought a Ferrari and you drove it and it was clunky and the experience wasn't very good, it's not real, is it? So you need all of those components to to serve you well, I think. And at its basic level, design is a beautiful thing. It's it's tangible. It's whether it's the interior of your house, your phone, 
building a piece of typography, whatever it is, why wouldn't it be amazing? Mm. I, I've noticed, you know, with a lot of the work that you guys put out, you know, obviously your website and your own um, communications is always top notch, but even just a, a, a quick social media post or a small ad or just a little bit of content here and there, there's always that, it's always crafted, always looks nice. It's always well designed. Where does that quality control? Who does that lie with? Is it the team? Is it yourself? And, and how do you make sure that you maintain a, a level of quality that goes out to the world? It's just our commitment to our version of excellence. You know, so, you know, when you think about creativity, I think the biggest driver of whether or not you think it's good is your own pride in the work. It's because awards, situations, all like that, that's all very good. But if you don't feel proud of the work, it's kind of meaningless. So that's the thing we center around first. And we just have this feeling that if you're going to make something, why not make something that excites yourself and makes you feel good about yourself and make, make something that's beautiful and interesting and different. And at the moment, there's this kind of radical sea of sameness. Everybody can see everything instantly. You can see every piece of design and communications in the world within a click of a button. And we all get the same cultural reference points. And it's how you edit those into something that feels yours and different and fresh and interesting. And on your terms, I think is interesting because otherwise you can get to good really quickly. Anybody can get to good now because of the technologies and systems and all the information to hand. Get into something that is original and different is quite hard. And we just constantly try and say, well, we did this. Could we do that? We did this. Could we do that? And I suppose it's become cultural because everybody in the company does it from the most junior person to the most senior in the case of me or Apova, I believe all care about making things that are beautiful. Are you, um, are you still getting your hands dirty? Are you still designing? Are you, or do you leave <laughs> that to the team now? I don't, um, I don't design projects in like a, in a classic sense. Um, you know, I do certain things like you, we did a digital book recently. So I'll, you know, I got my hands dirty in that. I fancied having a crack at, you know, designing some of that and some of the things you might see on social, um, you know, think that type of thing I might do. Um, but my job really is to create the space for other people to create now. So I've been very lucky in my career to do all sorts of kind of wild and wacky things and, and, and see how amazing it is to be a creative person. So I feel my job is to create the space for others, other people to be creative. And I don't just mean designers. I mean, everybody in the company, the producers, the strategists, people in operations, marketing, sales, whatever area of the company they're in, um, we're all creative people. And my job is to create the space for people to achieve their ambitions whilst they're with us, accelerate their careers whilst they're with us, and hopefully um, give them a safe space to push the envelope uh, as much as possible. Amazing. So we're going to round this up now, but this has been absolutely incredible. Thank you. Um, you it's, it's really cool how you talk about Dixon Baxi and you kind of refer it to, it's almost like um, Amazon, the day one, you know, always looking at reinvention, always looking at um, like it's the beginning of a new company almost. It's got that ambition and that energy. Where, what does the future look like? What could you, where do you see Dixon Baxi going in the next few years? <laughs> yeah that's a question I get asked a lot and it's quite a difficult one to answer in a two sense um I think I feel the industry needs to get up off the mat and start charging hard again because it's atrophied a little bit it's been knocked around by you know COVID I think the landscape's changed and the way technology's facilitated our ability to create for people that kind of the, the, the digital landscape I think is really interesting I think, you know, it's long since gone that every brand is digital, whether they're legacy brands or disruptive brands. But I think the, the way that technology facilitates relationships with the end audience and user, I think is a really interesting space. So we're spending a lot of time thinking about that. It's our 20th anniversary on October the 31st. So at some point we'll have a massive party to kind of thank everybody who's ever bumped into it. And we're going to think about what's next creatively. So we've got this itch that... We'd like to kind of just peel things back, break things down a bit and um, not reinvent, but retool how we um, experiment a bit more in terms of the expression of our creativity. And um, as much as possible, that's what we do. It's, it, it's, as long as we're self-determined and in control of our destiny, that, that's the ideal because we like living in the moment and doing something new rather than necessarily having a specific award or a specific studio or whatever. It's about the feeling of what it means to create 
Wow. And, and I can imagine Dixon Baxi Films is going to open a lot of doors, experimentation, new styles and whole areas of creativity and unlock different areas over the next few years. Yeah, fingers crossed. I mean, the, there's so many things we could do. You can make content. Yeah, I'm sure we're going to make some IP. We're, we're definitely thinking about content a lot in terms of how we express ourselves. Uh, we will do a retrospective as well. But I think what we're going to do is do a retrospective where half of it is looking back and half is looking forward. So some sort of kind of confluence of how we see the world. So, yeah, there's a lot of nice things we can do. We're hiring some people, which is fun. So we're, we're growing slightly. Um, and we work, like I said, we work internationally. So thinking about where our work serves people around the world and the fact that we can reach anywhere now, I think is a really interesting time for design. So we're um, thinking a lot about that as well. Brilliant. Okay, so anyone that's listening to this or watching this, where would you like to send them? Where can they find out more about you and the work that you do? Um, at Dixon Baxi or DixonBaxi.com is the best place to those two places. Magic. Well, thank you for your time, Simon. It's been amazing. Have a great rest of your day. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Thanks. It was a lot of fun. Thank you very much. So I hope you enjoyed that conversation. If you're a young designer and you're looking to start your career in the creative industries, I'm sure there's lots of gold there. But also if you're an agency owner or you run your own business, I'm sure there's lots of takeaways there that, are, that you can use within your own brand. If you want to find out more about Simon, I'm going to drop his details into the show notes or into the comments with the video on the platform that you're watching this on. If you want to find out more about him and the great work that he does, make sure you go and check out their website. But as always, be useful, be kind. I'll see you all soon. Bye.